Chapter 1, Towards Antarctica My name is William Morris, and the story that I'll tell, will radically change the way you view the world. I know many will find it incredible. And believe me, I do too, even though I experienced this adventure, having seen it with my own two eyes. But the proof is irrefutable to those who wish to see it, and the memories are unerasable. Such proof will be presented, and the science will also change your perspective, another path will be opened in the human mind forever. Regarding my personal life, I was a member of the Continental Army, what you call the U.S. Navy or Naval Force, in the War of Independence. I was married to Lucy and we were thinking about building a family. However the war postponed all plans, as it usually does, with a pain similar to that of a chopped root of that brilliant tree of which gives life to the garden, an immense pain that comes when you move away from your loved ones, while heading to hell itself. One peaceful night after the surrender of Saratoga, we were sailing through the north in the Atlantic Ocean. We were circling the islands towards the port of Charleston. The full moon was the only light that lit up our path that night. Thousands of stories and anecdotes arose between the boys in between a little whiskey to calm anxieties of a bumpy war. At the time, there was already talk of the voyages of James Cook and his obsession of crossing the polar Antarctic Circle. Although it was not well known who was behind his financing or why such obsession, nor was I into the subject at hand. I wasn't captivated enough, and I wasn't paying much attention. The boys just continued with their stories. The captain, Butler, who was well respected in the group, joined the navigation stories commenting that it was possible that there was a passage somewhere in the polar Antarctic Circle, and that such passage could be the connector or portal to other worlds. He said it seriously, without hesitation for an instant. My attention turned to him, and the five or six people who were in that cabin became speechless as we listened to his story. We expected him to say that it was a joke but that never happened. We could not believe that a captain was seriously telling us that land could exist behind the polar Antarctic Circle. Butler commented that he knew from good sources of which came from the highest spheres. That these top dogs were researching and investigating trips to where they can penetrate the harsh climate and existing barriers in the southern latitudes. To possibly find land and civilization beyond the Antarctic Circle that they were quite in a hurry to carry out these missions, now that many civilian sailors were surrounding that area and were giving dirty looks when someone would arrive there. This story was even longer and with much more detail. He also commented that he saw with his own eyes a map indicating the coordinates that could be the opening of said passage. And even though I was stunned I'm sure others were too. The tiredness and stress from war could not be wasted, it was the perfect moment of joy that creates a gap of peace to be able to sleep for a couple of hours. Time passed, and after the famous war, many of the ships used by the Navy, were rented, destroyed, captured or sold. At the time I was a person of good economic standing, especially after a war we could call, triumphant. If after a war it can be called that. I managed to make an offer to have one of them and managed to keep it although my colleagues always made fun of such a trade. They said it was ridiculously high for such an old ship. The idea of an exploration towards the south after Butler's story created even more interest in me. To bid and keep such a ship, although it did need repairs, in which case meant more money, I didn't feel any guilt since it felt like an investment. However, I didn't know the danger of such a trip. I needed to provide myself with great navigational equipment. Lucy my wife was not happy about this plan, and this also caused some delay. By the end of November I planned to leave Charleston. And head with a few stops along the way, directly towards the Antarctica continent. During the idea of forming a team, I spoke with former colleagues and some of them made some of the most ridiculous excuses to not come along. And I don't blame them either, the idea of said trip was not very encouraging. Two of them, who were there that same night that Butler told his story, wanted to join the team as soon as I told them about the plan. But the most difficult thing was yet to come. Convincing Captain Butler. The one who had knowledge in navigation based on his experience and leadership. He also had the coordinates to where we should go. Once we gained the courage throughout some weeks, I contacted Captain Butler to present my project and add him to the group. 
It was very difficult to convince Captain Butler of such a plan, and although I heard certain enthusiasm in his voice, he declined my offer and did so for a while. Unexpectedly, in the morning of October 11th, he showed up at my house with another colleague named Fint, and he brought maps that I had never seen. He was full of documents of which very few eyes have read. He ended up telling me that he accepted the deal, but that I should be willing to understand that this could be a one-way trip. That's when I understood that we should take this trip professionally, and so the adventure was about to begin.